Hello, babies. How you doing? Welcome back to The Wolf Among Us. I know you're asking yourself, why the hell am I making another recording of this? Well, it's so we can go through the extras. So sit back. The Book of Fables. Oh my god. Yep. Oh, there's so many. And you got almost all of them. I got almost all of them? Yeah. Oh, those two are missing. There's two there, and I think there's three on the next one. Yeah. Oh. So you're only missing five, and they tell you what chapter they're in. <coughs> okay. The renowned Big Bad Wolf. He's known for tormenting pigs and gulls and red hoods. But is he trying to put those dark days behind him? Baby now acts like a fellow town's fable town sheriff and remains in his human form. Mostly... However, due to his rough past, the citizens of Fabletown are slow to trust him. Uh, shit, I, I lost where I was. Baby now acts as Fab. Yeah, okay. However, due to his rough past. Okay. Big B is determined to show that he's truly changed. But some instincts are just too hard to control. Alright. So we do know about this stuff. Snow White may seem cold, but this stemmed from her life of mistreatment and abuse back in the homeland after escaping assault and imprisonment. Not to mention the attempt on her life. She married Prince Charming. It wasn't long before Snow discovered that Charming cheated on her with her estranged sister, Rose Red. Oh my god. Okay. At least she divorced him. Yeah, no. Yeah, this is the extras. I'm gonna read off extras about these characters in this game and in the comics. So if you guys want to skip this, you can. My feelings are not hurt at all. But if you want to read along with me, how you doing? Stay enjoying. After the Exodus Snow, wait, Exodus? Exodus. Exodus, okay. okay. Snow focused her attention on setting up a safe haven for fables in the new world. Uh, shit. She now serves as assistant to the deputy mayor of Fable Town. Yay! If you need me to read too, just let me know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just when I move the mouse, I lose my oh, place. Yeah. It's like, oh god, where am I? Yeah, I get it. I'm not this terrible, I swear to god. Also, there's an over arrow. An over arrow? No, uh, no, go ahead and click on Woodsman. Uh huh. Look to the right. Yeah, so when you want to move on, yeah. Oh, oh, that makes things easy. Yeah. The Woodsman is one of the few men who went toe to toe with Big Ba, with Big B. In his Black Falls days, and lived to tell the tale. In the attempt to save Little Red Riding Hood, he split the great wolf's belly open with his axe, filled him with rocks, and threw him the beast in the river. To his dismay, his popularity has faded. Even his name is forgotten, and he is only known as the Woodsman. Oh, I do like Woody. Faith! One of the most trauma-based characters I could find. Faith, otherwise known as Donkey Skin Girl, made it through the Exodus from the magical homeland with the clothes on her back, her husband, and nothing else. She was once a beautiful princess, happily married to Prince Lawrence of the neighboring kingdom. There we go. Her life should have had a happy ending. But the mundane city of New York wasn't kind to her, or her marriage. With no money, Faith found herself turning tricks to make the rent for a cheap apartment on the outskirts of Fable Town. She had a difficult life, but she did what she could do to survive the unfair world. Beauty! I thought you were better than this, damn it! Beauty and her husband, Beast, once lived in an enchanted castle. But they were forced to flee the homelands in the Azotus, leaving all the wealth behind. Now they live a modest studio in Fable Town. Notice I put it in quotes, yeah, too. Yeah, modest. 
don't live above your means. Wasn't you supposed to be a fucking peasant woman before? I'm just saying, she should have known by though. She's supposed to be the smart one. Her dad was smart. Yeah. She got full Stockholm and yeah, I... married a literal monster and, uh... Well, I mean, you're trapped in a castle. You got nothing else to do. Yeah. You're gonna beat his ass, choke him out, and then pop out some fuzzy babies. So, okay. I, I said my piece. Third times are hard. With beasts walking multiple jobs to pay the bills, the couple have the longest lasting relationship of all the fables. But is it a good relationship? That is a question. Beast, you jackass. Beast and his wife, Beauty, left everything behind when they escaped the homelands in the Exodus. Without his former wealth, Beast must pick up extra work to make ends meet. He is able to get around Fable Town without a glamour most of the time. But if Beauty gets too angry with him. Fuck! But be Beauty gets too angry with him. He becomes more beastly by the minute. Growing horns and large teeth. Despite the occasional bickering, the two are truly in love and have the longest relationship of anyone in Fable Town. You can be in love, but love doesn't pay the bills. You gotta live that modest life. Don't love above your means. Yep. I can't really put all that on him because he was a prince born into wealth. He got cursed when he was like 10, which is really weird. Mr. Toad the Slumlord. Yeah, he is. Mr. Toad is the superintendent for a functioning for a defunct tenement. Oh, good God! On the edge of Fable Town proper, because he's a three and a half foot talking amphibian. Toad is required by Fable Town law to keep his family and himself magically glamoured to appear human. The problem is Toad isn't too concerned with what the. with what the law is and has to be reminded often. Thank you. I was like, how? It's like, it jumps like, it, it tricks me. Like, you see the jump hill? You might have better luck if you just scroll it. Like yeah, that. I think I'm just gonna fucking scroll. Fuck it, I'll scroll it. Colin, Couch Soffle. That, that's a good name for him. Colin is better known as one of the three little pigs. Back in the homelands, they were harassed by the big bad wolf, who blew down Colin's house of straw. After the Zodus, Colin and the other fables couldn't pass for human and were sent to live at the farm in upstate New York. Unable to stand such a boring life. Boring? It's not abusive, it's not treacherous, it's oh. just boring? Yeah, the farm is literal. You don't get any info on the farm, but the farm is literally an open farm. That's all it is. It's just an open farm where fables live as they are. And this is, and, and this, I, oh my god. And They want abusive, magical, normal human lives? Where they struggle and suffer to pay rent and bills when they could just go on the fucking farm, live rent free? I mean, according to Colin, it's boring. Oh my god. Okay. 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 Uh. Colin constantly makes trips down to Favorite Town to bother Bigby. He's always caught and sent back to the farm, but he doesn't let that stop him. <laughs> I mean, it could probably crane you dirty man. Hailing from the haunted town of Sleepy Hollow, Iqbal Crane has been deputy mayor of Fable Town for nearly a hundred and fifteen fucking years. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Fables live a lot longer than humans. Crane is a bundle of nerves and takes his job very seriously. But have you? Oh, uh, do you take something else seriously, huh? <laughs> uh, though that doesn't mean he always does it well, no shit. As one of Fable Town's elite, C 
Ukraine is often blind to the troubles of the less well-off citizens. Of all, Ukraine is Athelian, cowardly, and always hiding something. Yeah. Buffkin! Buffkin! Buffkin is talking winged monkey from the land of Oz. Now his favorite town is librarian. He spends his time reading and stealing the deputy mayor's booze. <laughs> How it should be. He's prone to mischief. So when something goes wrong, he assumes he'll receive the lion's share of the blame. He's helpful when he wants to be, but most of the time he'd rather be drinking. You drunken bastard. Need an AA meeting. Someone would love... Someone would have hired him a long time ago, but he's the only one who can make sense of the filing system. Yep. Oh, oh, filed him. Okay. I was gonna say, what fucking filing system? There is no system! He has his own system. Just as any good secretary does, you have your own system that no one else can recreate or understand. Fair enough, fair, fair Job enough. Job security. Huh? Job security. Fair enough. Okay. Fable Town. Fable Town is a community located on the Bullfinch Street of Manhattan's Upper West Side. To regular people, or Mondays, it appears to be an ordinary New York neighborhood, but it is really the home of fables. From many worlds and within the business office of the Woodlands lies a massive cavern, a vast library, and hundreds of magical items of the intense power, immense power. All non-human fables live upstate on the farm, an extension of Fable Town. Ooh. Just put my ass on the farm. I, I like sunshine, I like trees. I hate paying rent. Just put me on the farm. The farm is home. Oh, here's the farm. Yeah. Okay. The farm is home to fables who cannot pass as human. Giants, goblins, animals, etc. is located in upstate New York far enough away from the Mondays to avoid detection. Some of its residents resent their confinement to the farm despite its size and comfort. It has comfort and you're bitching about it? Yep. To them, the farm is a prison. Fucking send me to prison. They would be allowed to leave the farm if they could uh, purchase a glamour, but many don't have the money for something so expensive. Though some, like Colin, sneak out to the city anyway. Mondays! Oh, non fair. Oh, the cops on Mondays. Okay. Short for mundane. Monday is a catch all term for fables to use or fall to the non magical inhabitants of the adopted home. Wooden spells place around the blocks of Fable Town and the farms keep their minds distracted and dull within certain boundaries. However, if anything should peak the curiosity or scrutiny of a large group of Mondays, these magical protection charms would overload and fail. As Sheriff of Fable Town, one of Big B's primary functions is assuring the Fable Town community maintains a low profile. Yeah, I think it's a little tougher than you think. Glamours, the sky spells. Glamours are spells that allow the user to change their appearance. They are expensive but it can be purchased by non-human fables in order to pass for humans among the Mondays. Cheap glamours can be found on the seedier parts of Fable Town, but they are often unreliable and prone to sudden failure. Okay. I'm sorry I killed you! Prince Lawrence. After escaping the homelands, Prince Lawrence and his wife Faith immensely fell victim to the harsh realities of the mundane world. They moved to New York, New York, hoping to find aid in the community and fellow fables. But without enough money to live in Fable Town, they had to settle in an apartment on the outskirts of the neighborhood. Unfortunately, that meant they were out of sight and out of mind when it came to government assistance. The prospects during the link. Faith left Lawrence to try to make it on her own, 
Now, without his wife for support, Lauren struggles to motivate himself and quickly sinks into depression. Ow. Oh, sorry. The Tweedles! I'm so glad I killed one of you fat fucks. The Tweedle Brothers, Dumb and D, are thugs for hire. They appear human, allowing them to carry out their contracts in the Monday world without drawing suspicion. They are inseparable and they are ruthless. See, I said it was good to kill one of those motherfuckers. Holly. Holly is a non, no nonsense kind of troll and the owner of the Trip Trap Ball. She's glamour to appear human, but her patrons know better. Holly takes good care of her regulars, often the downtrod fables with little to spell, but she has no patience for Fable Town government that has done nothing to locate her missing sister. I still feel bad about that. Grindle, also a drifter. Isn't he adorable? Look at that face. No. I even love the detail about his arm. Yeah. Grindle just wants to be left alone. In the old days, he terrorized Norse mead holes. But lately, he can be found occupying a store in various quiet, dumpy bars around New York. He hates the noise of the city, but must walk there to afford his glamour. Despite his gruff bearing, he's fiercely loyal to those who've wanted to offer him the space and silence he desires. Talking to him like watching a time bomb tick down is only a matter of time. I mean, yeah. Bluebeard! The wealthy scoundrel! Yeah! Who also likes to murder everyone he marries. <clears throat> Bluebeard managed to escape the homelands within. With his riches intact, of course he did, of course he did, and continues to be one of the wealthiest fables in New York. Fabletown government depends on his generous contributions, and he often uses his influence for his own benefit. As a formal serial killer, FORMAL SERIAL KILLER, RIGHT HERE, RIGHT HERE, because if y'all didn't know the story of Bluebeard, he was that murderous psychopath motherfucker who murders everyone he marries. Uh, he claims his days of decapitating his brides over all, yeah, it's all over, guys. He's a good guy. He says sorry. He's gonna, he's gonna stick, he's just gonna stick with some lotion and tissue, and he's gonna stop marrying and murdering his lovers. Okay, I'm done. But even if he was able to leave his violent ways in Homeland, that hasn't stopped him from making the occasional trip down Crooked Lane. No shit! Big B's. Oh, Big B's and Marcy. In the days leading up to Exodus, the Big Bad Wolf hunted armies of men and goblins in the Black Forest. These invading forces had driven off great beasts before the quarry, and their own flesh was rotten with corruption. Holly a suitable replacement. He made it his game to destroy their camps, devour the night watchmen, and disrupt those supply trains while sparking, sharing the prisoners. Okay. Sparing their prisoners. Oh, sparing the prisoners. Okay. Okay, because, okay, okay, because I, I, I remember, I remember a fable like that. One day he broke the ranks and discovered a particular woman they held captive. Her skin was white as snow, but her hair was dark as the night sky. She approached, he approached her and she, knowing no soul could match the giant wolf's power, bravely paced her shackles in the beast's mouth. He freed her, but years would pass before the two would meet again in the Monday world. Okay. Yeah, okay. Bluebill's Marcy. Bluebill's last wife. Bullshit! He wanted to marry her. He did marry her. And then... She found out, and then she had all, like, seven brothers come in and stab this piece of shit right in the ass. Then he died, and then she escaped with all his money. That's the fable. I'm going to read this one. I mean, that's literally what it says. Really? Oh, my God. <laughs> I, gotta, I, I gotta read this for my own sanity. After a long line of marriages resulting in mysterious disappearances, Blue Bloods... Blue, 
Bald's, I keep saying Bald's, Blue Beard's last wife in the homeland was naturally suspicious of him. One day he departed on business, leaving her alone in his estate. He gave her free reign of all the rooms, but he made a promise not to open the closet on the ground floor. She defied him, of course, and discovered the location of his missing wives. When Blue Beard returned, he knew he must kill her before she revealed his murderous secret. She persuaded him to allow her a moment to pray, which he reluctantly granted. This small mercy gave her brothers time to arrive and rescue, and Bluebeard's crimes were exposed. You got stabbed in the ass 17 times. Okay. Okay. The 13th floor of the home of the Woodland building is home to a group of witches and wizards tasked with the protection of Fable Town. They use the powers to keep the community hidden from prying Mundy's eyes. But all magic has its limits, and every spell has its cost. The thought you fall. Oh, that'd be fun to visit. The magic mill. The magic mill speaks mostly in rhyme and demands that others do the same. It also requires the name of whatever object or person you wish to find. Well, yeah, how else is he gonna know who to find? If you follow these rules, the mail will show you a glimpse of whatever you want to see, but nothing more. Fair enough. The Witching Well. Witching Well, Witching Well. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm done. The Witching Well is located in the chamber inside of Woodland Building, where it is used to dispose of things meant to never be seen again. Dead fables are committed to its depths and are the most unredeemable criminals. Oh, as are the most unredeemable criminals. Okay. No one is entirely sure what lies at the bottom of the well. No indeed if it has the bottom at all. But it is widely assumed it is to be a passageway to the final resting place. Assumed, but you don't know. Well, yeah, nobody knows. Jack Horner! Oh, Jack. I, I, I love him. I do love him. Jack is always up to something, but he's not nearly as smart as he thinks he is. No. No, no he ain't. ain't. His plans to get rich quick often backfire, but his confidence never wavers. He thinks he's the most important person in Fable Town, but everyone knows him as a mostly harmless smartass. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Little, oh, oh. Hi, Lily. Lily and her sister, Holly, grew up in the homeland together, but had a falling out shortly after moving to the mundane world. Aimless and increasingly destitute, Lily turned to prostitution. And now, she's the second victim of an ongoing murder investigation. Troll Cross. Ooh. A troll cross is an ambulance made of iron that was foolishly thought to protect the well from trolls. Lily acquired hers while wandering through the wilderness searching for something to eat. She came across a human, but before she could devour him, he held the troll cross out and shouted, Back! Back, you troll! After enjoying her tasty snack, Lily plucked the cross from the dead man's hands. After the exodus, she wore the troll across constantly as a reminder of battle days. I, I mean, yeah. Georgie Porgy the Pimp. <laughs> I love his name. Georgie Porgy. It's, it's like, you see this guy. You don't think that his name is Georgie Porgy. There's like a, ch that is like the cutest nickname. Oh my God, for a fucking pimp. Pimp, adorable pimp nickname, okay? Georgie runs the Pudding and Pie, and strip, a strip club that also caters to unmentionable desires of Fable Town citizens. He has tried just about everything there is to try in pursuit of worldly pleasures, but none as of it satisfies him for long. He does seem to enjoy pushing people's buttons. So. He takes pride in his nightclub and doesn't react well to anyone meddling in his affairs. Well, no. 
Clavo Hans. Hans is beefy as fuck, okay? I mean, yeah. He is beefy as fuck. Clever Hands always does exactly what he's told. However, he often misunderstands his instructions and ends up hurting himself or behaving oddly. As in the case of his noted fable, though, where he threw sheep's eyes at his wife. I forgot about that. Yep. No! Fuck! Oh my god, I forgot about that. Uh, oh, no. Stop. <laughs> Bob, it's... <laughs> do, you, do you feel better about your life? I wonder if it holds something. Yeah, the neighbors exist. <laughs> Sir. Okay. Yeah, he threw sheep eyes at his wife. Unsurprisingly, she left him. And now Hans walks as a bouncer at George's, George's club. He hopes to dance on stage one day, but for now he's content sweeping up and making sure the crowd doesn't get out of hand. Yeah, bust a move, Hans. Narissa, the little mermaid. Oh, wait. Okay. Narissa's stories never had a happy ending. She's known as the Little Mermaid, the young girl who gave up her tail for a pair of legs in the hopes of winning the heart of a handsome prince. When he married the princess instead, Nerissa was left heartbroken. Oh, damn. She made the journey to the mundane world hoping for a better life. Now she dances at the pudding and pie, but each step she takes feels like walking on shards of glass. She has very little left but find some comfort in the company of her fellow dancers. Vivian. Yeah, yeah, I, I do remember her uh, story quite well. Much of Vivian's past is unknown, so she prefers not to talk about her life back in the homelands. She wanted to start fresh in Fable Town, but she finds herself walking for Georgie at the pudding pie. Is it... It's not a terrible life. Georgie's took a liking to Vivian, so he doesn't make her take jobs at the open arms. Instead, she plays hostess and helps Georgie ensure complete customer satisfaction. By killing. Yeah, pretty much. Swineheart! Yep, Swineheart. The Swineheart is a resident favorite town physician. So skilled in the art of instrumental surgery that he can safely operate on himself. He served as an army medic for many years, sometimes using his talents to impress the locals. He constantly runs... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> he currently runs the special research section of the Knights of Matla Hospital, so named to discourage people for investigating what it actually resolved. Fable-focused health facility. Okay. And need a quick blub. I can read the next couple if you want. Okay. <coughs> okay, no one. Oh, do, do you want me to uh, touch the screen? Oh no, I'm good. Flycatcher! He's so cute. A former he prince is. turned to a frog by a witch. The friendly, genial flycatcher now carries the nickname as an unsubtle reference to his propensity for catching and eating flies. His wife and their children are brutally murdered back in the homelands, a fact he attempts to deny himself by committing to a series of endless tasks and janitorial duties. Oh, oh I just look at his watch real fast. Yeah. Oh my god, it's so cute. Oh, that's so sad! Yeah. Oh my god, that's so sad. 
the headless horseman, the Hessian spirit. Thought to be the spirit of a particularly fearsome, especially macabre, German military contractor, the headless horseman lost his head from cannon fire during the Revolutionary War. Most famous for hounding Ichabod Crane one night in the woods of Sleepy Hollow, it's rumored that this phantom is only the most recent incarnation of a primordial demon, whose previous forms include a middle-aged chieftain who brandished a whip made of human bone, and a Scottish lord who was decapitated in a fight over shares of land. Well, then. Because the uh, uh, show series of Sleepy Hollow. He is, in fact, an immortal demon who comes back in different forms. Ooh, oh, that's cool. <clears throat> the Trip Trap Bar, also known as a watering hole. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest bar in New York City, the Trip Trap was established in 1725 in secret by Starcod, the legendary Viking and reprobate, as a place for fables to meet and drink and commiserate. Known then only as the Grimmarian's Tavern, he eventually lost it in a bet to a tribe of mountain trolls, who quickly renamed it and made it their own. Holly is the current proprietor, having inherited it from her mother when she died in a boating accident in the early 20th century. Oh. <coughs> Auntie Greenleaf, the White Dale. You can read it. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Yeah, yeah. Horticulturist, alchemist, and lover of animals, Auntie Greenleaf is one of the few rogue witches still living outside of the 13th floor, unsupervised and unrestricted. Rumored to have lost a daughter in the homelands, she suffers paranoia and depressive mood swings, and will only venture outside at irregular hours under the guise of an ethereal white deer, an oft-whispered specter of the Brookhaven natives. Uh, she got tiny hands. The Glamour Tube. A handy disguise. Glamours can be produced in a variety of ways, but one of the most common due to its ease of use is to take a small hollowed out tube or container and place it within several items unique to whomama who to whomever the caster wants to copy, a witch is required to the reactionary charm. Two downsides of this type of glamour is that totally unique appearance are completely impossible, and the nature of the vessel makes it quite unstable. Ooh. Want to read this one? Sure. The Ring of Dispel, the Arthurian Band. Reputed to be it fashioned by a Byzantine clan in an attempt to ward off a coven of witches, the Ring of Dispel, or the Dispelling Ring, or the Magic Canceling Ring, eventually was given to Lancelot by the Lady in the Lake. Recovered by the business office after the emigration <coughs> to New Amsterdam, it was assigned to Greenleaf for caretaking. Okay. There you go. All right, Bloody Mary, the urban legend. The true history of the person known as Bloody Mary is almost completely unknown. Even to fables, the most adequate of it with its members. Her name is Mary, at least, is not up for con contention. Nor is her penchant for shock and violence and inlaid residence of to magic and spells and a strange ability to use any reflection surface as a portal. Reflectively, short cuttings, space and time, thought by Mondays to be the wailing apparition of a childish ghost, childless ghost, though any evidence of that is as yet unseen. She's just a psycho. She's just a psycho who likes to kill everybody. She's a psycho. She's a psycho. She's a psycho, bitch. Okay. Silver bullets. Wolf's weakness. Legends of great and magical wolves often make mentions of the weakness against weapons made of silver. 
And those tales bow out to be true. The silver bullets Mary shot Bigby with was not the false, but any of them could be his last. Any silver left in Bigby's body weakens his system, slows his healing, and can cause long-term damage. So it's not... It's kind of shitty. Acting Deputy Snow White with Ichabob Crane formerly out of the picture and King Cole still absent, the task of leading Fable Towns fall squarely on Snow's shoulders. She has performed many of the job's duties for a long time, picking up the slack for Crane, but now that she's fully in charge of the business office, she has to deal with a new level of politicking she had not previously been, previously been exposed to. Donkey skin coat. Hide in plain sight. Only the truly beautiful will fully understands the power of the coat that makes the will appear ugly. It is the power to be invisible while still being seen. Unfortunately, its value can also be hard to see. But it's still a magic coat and some collectors. And to some collectors, that's enough. I mean, that's true. I would love to have that. You want to read your buddy? I do. I'm gonna finish choking to death. Okay. The Josie Devil! Gotta stay good! Okay. Oh god. Yeah, yeah. I chose the worst time to have a, uh. coughing. You good? You good, bro? And um, we can just cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> The Jersey Devil, the Garden State Goon. Gee, can you figure out what state he's from? Um, <laughs> he's. I know where he is from. He's from Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of the fables who came to this world landed in Fable Town. Those, there are those who scattered across the farthest corners of the earth, and there are those who simply prefer the Garden State to the Empire State, such as the Jersey Devil. Reports of its appearance have varied, although most accounts make mention of leathery wings, but an encounter with a certain axe of legend some years ago has temporarily re rendered that feature absent. Mm-hmm. Not gonna lie, he kinda looks like a Wendigo. He does. That's one of the reasons why I like him so much. <coughs> I think he's adorable like this, but damn in his human form, he is fugly as shit. I mean... He is fugly... He, he looks like a... In his human form, he looks like he needs to be put on a list. I mean, and it's just stay there. <laughs> I, I like Jersey. I it's not a bad place as long as you don't talk to anybody. Yeah, if you don't talk or interact with people, and uh... the beach is little to shit though. When I went though, okay, woodsman's axe and sorcelled. What the fuck? What it was enchanted by druids. What's just a simple tool for fell falling trees? For felling trees? Yes. That's felling trees. Okay. Wow, my mind is jumbled today. The axe became much more when it was ensorched. Well, enchanted. It's enchanted. I'm saying enchanted. By druids and marked with their runes. But it truly became an object of legend when the woodmen used it to slice the big bad wolf from the nave to neck. In protection of Little Red Riding Hood, it may carry old world charm, but it's simply of design and quality workmanship make it an effective tool. A weapon, even today. You can use it like a tool, or you can use it to model people. That's all up to you. <laughs> Johan, the butcher. Johan. Johan? Yes. Oh, 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 Johan is, uh, is that German? Yeah. Okay. German uh, or Austrian, I forget. Okay, Johan. Sorry. Sorry, Johan. His name is often said in the same breath as that of the bagel and the candlestick maker of Fable Town, who are both douchebags. And like those other tradesmen, uh, Johan, the butcher storefront, has sold Fable Town for ages. Fresh cuts, bullshit, exotic meat, and even full size of beef for the vigorous appetites of ogres and trolls. 
But Johan's business has fallen on hard times and falling in the wrong crowd. As the quality of his produce products decline and his business turned into a front operation for the crooked man, some may have started to wonder if they ever really knew Johan. I mean you let the you let the quality of your meat go down. I don't care if you're being run over by a fucking mob boss. You gotta take care of that meat. You gotta think of the bacon and the bacon bits and the beef. Alright, I'm just saying. And the bacon beef. <laughs> and the bacon beef. You gotta get that bacon beef. Bluebird's money. One might think that Bluebird donates funds to Fabertown's government for nefarious purposes. Seeking special favors. Or to have a lot of voice in government proceedings. But what he really wants is stability and strength. Because, as far as Bluebeard is concerned, Fable Town exists to insulate him from the Monday world. Okay. As much as his money can be a sword, so it also serves as a shield. Fair enough. Fair enough. The Crooked Liar. Headquarters. Occupying a desolent church. Wait, desanctified church. This is one of many locations of the Crooked Man's operation used to run the Fable Town Underworld. Its lounge atmosphere makes for a comfortable meeting place unless you are an unwelcome guest. It is completely bored up to the outside world, and the only way in and is through one of the many portals marked by the door with the crooked man's Catherine shield on it, scattered throughout the city and elsewhere. Okay. So I, I was a little distracted because this is moving. I'm seeing this in the corner of my eye as I'm trying to read the text. It's like, yeah, that's moving. The Crooked Man, the Crime Lord. Still better looking than the fucking Jersey Devil. Okay. The Crooked Man has slowly built himself into one of the most powerful figures in Fable Town. His operation started with a crooked sixpence in a crooked house. Two things he cared about more than his wife or his children, whom he liked rather. He killed. Than. What? Whom oh. he killed. Oh! Whoops. Yeah. He cared about more than his wife or children whom he killed rather than let them stand in his way. What a dick! In his rise, the crooked man has ensnared many fables in his criminal web, providing them with what they need, but always at a high cost. He is cunning, persuasive, and ruthless. Murder! Yeah, pretty much. Tiny Tim, no! While most fables theorize that the longevity and overall well-being is improved by the Monday world's knowledge of them, for a select few that does not seem to apply. When a milady, yeah, milady, or angel, injury is an integral part of the fable story, that notary can make recovery can make recovery nearly impossible. Okay, okay. That's what Tiny Tim thinks, at least. And no medical care or magic, rather, none that he can afford, can heal his leg. Have he never heard of Dr. Swinehart? Go see him! That motherfucker's fabulous! He can fix you up. Life on the farm, which looks really comfortable by the- It looks like the Ren Fell Fest, uh, like, real close to my place. With his idyllic location and managed community, community, the farm would seem to be a welcome alternative to eking out the existence of Fable Town. But those who have to live there see it very differently. They see it for what it is, a prison. A place where you are free to be who you are and do whatever you please, except leave. I, I, I will live though. I will live though right now. Just pack my shit. Tell me how my books, my Wi-Fi. I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm going to this place. 
It doesn't help that while fables who appeal human do not have to worry about being sent to the farm, they always seem to fill the leadership roles there. Just let me go live though. Vivian's story, the girl with the ribbon. Vivian was the very first to bear the cost of the purple ribbon. And I do know this story. Removing the ribbon will result in death, and any attempt to talk about was thwarted by a spell upon it. As time went on, she tried to live a normal life. Eventually, she married a nice man. But he was constantly wondering about the ribbon around her neck. Despite her pleas for him to leave it alone, one night, while she was sleeping, he attempted to remove it. As he pulled the edge of the string, Vivian woke and saw what her husband was doing. In a panic, she pulled away, preventing the ribbons not from being undone. Furious, she tried to express the severity of his action, but her husband was not able, was unable to understand. She realized then that she couldn't trust him and decided to leave. She lived alone for the rest of her days in the homelands, preferring the safety of isolation to the risk of another betrayal. Quick. Okay, for those who don't know, Vivian, um, I forget what her, one of her stories is because she got a few different versions of her story. Basically, she was a daughter of um, a, a nice guy. He was a nice guy, uh, but her stepmother wanted to live in Eve, so she married the father. But the stepmother hated Vivian, and then... She killed Vivian and put a, a purple ribbon around her neck so she couldn't tell anyone what had happened to her. I, there's a few different versions of the story, but she came back as a bard. Uh, the stepmother killed the bard and fed it to her husband. And Vivian kept coming back in different ways to tell what happened without telling what happened. The Pudding and Pie. I just gotta know, like, why is it named the Pudding and Pie? Because Georgie Porgy. Alright, give me a second. Let me hunt it down. Okay. Because there were various points I was gonna read some of the fairy tale rhymes, but. Oh, did you want to do that? It's too late now. We already finished the series. We can always do it now. Vivian Georgie's place. Hold on. Let me... I'm trying to find it now. Okay. Georgie Porgy Puddin' and Pie kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. There you go. That's it. That was fabulous. Yep. It's... <laughs> okay. Vivian and Georgie met during the exodus, exodus from the homelands, and they helped each other survive the long journey to the Monday world. Upon their arrival, however, they found it hard to make a decent living. With what little money they had, they opened a pudding and pie. Operating the strip club may not have been the most desirable occupation, but they figured it was better to be in charge of a place like this than be forced through desperation to walk at one. That, that, that's true. Yeah. Here we go. Rental Wolf. <laughs> okay, yeah. It was, it was after I finished the game. It took me an hour because um, when I was fighting Bitch Tits Glass uh, Mary, Blind Mary, she said something about uh, Bigby's mother fucking any form of breeze. It's like, wait, what the fuck is she talking about? And then it hit me, I know that fable too. It's one of the most unknown fables out there. Yeah, it is. Bigby's mother, Wintel, fell in love with the North Wind and bore him seven wolf cubs. But he quickly grew tired of her and left, and left Wintel. 
Heartbroken and alone, she tried to care for her pups despite her grief. She was especially fond of Bigby, but as a run through the litter, he was often teased by his older brothers. After Winter's death, Bigby's siblings went in search of, of their father. But Bigby stayed behind to protect his mother's corpse from scavengers. Unfortunately, he was too small to defend her. From then on, he vowed to eat something bigger each day until he was large enough to confront his father and finally make him pay for the pain he caused his family. Oh, Puppy! Oh, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. I still want him to snow with the hookup, alright? I, I know I said it a lot before, but damn do I want that to happen. Bigby's true form is that of a giant eight foot tall wolf. In addition to his ironic huff and puff power, he has also inherited another abilities from his father, the North One. Okay. <coughs> for example, Bigby is able to hold his breath for an abnormally long amount of time and making it impossible for him to drown. That is quite handy. Yep. That is very handy. Mary's loyalty, part of the job. Bloody Mary began walking for the crooked man many centuries ago. He promised her freedom to do as she pleased, as long as she agreed to act as his potential bodyguard and hitman. Because of the crooked man's power and influence, Mary never had to worry about getting caught by the authorities. She enjoys her job immensely and would defend the crooked man to the death, mostly because she finds it fun. Fable Town Justice when the criminal is captured in Fabletown, the traditional process, uh, procedure is to hold a formal hearing in front of the community or concerned parties. However, exceptions are often made to expedite the process. In reality, there aren't any hard and fast rules for these types of situations. And the extent to which policies are upheld to depend on who is being charged. A new order. Snow White is in charge. With Crane now the picture, Mayor Cole has officially appointed Snow White as the director of operations and deputy mayor in his absence. Many would say his promotion to a long time is a long time coming, since she was instrumental in the th in the establishment of Fable Town and personally ensure that many fables are made it to the new world safely. She also has been doing the walk of Debbie Mayo unofficially for years. So yeah, that makes sense. Sheriff, Sheriff Bigby. Bigby. <laughs> After fleeing the homelands, Bigby Wolf spent many years wandering through Europe. With the fable colony quickly developing in new in the new world, Snow White and Feathertop tracked down the wolf and offered him passage to Fable Town. He agreed and Snow caught him with a lanthropy stained knife to give him the power to change into human form at will. Why can't there be more fucking objects like that? Then they will, then no one has to worry about the glamour. Like, well, I mean, it completely changes who you are, so... But does it? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, never mind then. <laughs> with a lepus, uh... Yeah... Uh, stay in life to give him the power to change into human form at will. Bigby became the sheriff of Fable Town under King Cole's administration. But because of his violent past, many Fables didn't trust him and he was banned from ever setting foot on the farm. To this day, he struggles to redeem himself in the eyes of the community. I mean, is that it? That is it? Yep. Ah. Uh... So. In chapter one, you have one more choice. Chapter two, there is one. Chapter three, there's two. And chapter four, there is one. Okay. So, these are the extras. The things you did not know about. Or if you did, I'm glad that you stuck around to watch it. This is awesome. It's good to know uh, a bit more about each of the characters because there is a lot of information here that I wasn't aware of. I never read the comics. I never heard of this game up until uh, a few days ago. So, and I powered played this game. Yes. 
for like what eight hours, eight fucking hours straight, and then it was like I'm drooling. I got one eye going this way, I got another eye going that way, and I got drool coming out of my mouth by the end of uh, recording. But anyway, um, yeah, there's there's so much information. There's still more choices that can lead to different directions, and this was just great. This is <clears throat> overall a wonderful game to play, and having things explained, especially in the extras, was truly amazing. Is there anything else? Achievements? I have achievements. Yep. Ooh. You're missing half of them in the looks of it. I guess I gotta play this game again. Alrighty. So. So. Oh, that's my fun. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this game was an absolute blast. Thank you so much for watching this. If you did manage to watch up until this point. I really appreciate it. I love y'all. So. Promise leads. So. 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 Go ahead. But okay. Thank you everyone for watching. If you like this, awesome. Feel free to check me out on future Let's Plays. So until next time. Bye. So. So. No respect for the dead. Yeah, complete episode two. I didn't complete episode two? Guess not. Complete chapter five of episode two. What? Chapter four of episode two. Chapter three, chapter two. Oh. What? Okay. Okay. We are gonna worry about those. Yeah, I'm not worried about those. Okay.